I'm going to talk a little bit about vaccines today, but I actually work on viruses at Stanford. The other day, I went to uh, a little video game conference, and I, I was playing this game called, uh, does anybody know the name of this game? Oregon Trail. And unfortunately, one of my characters, who's actually the, the speaker who just gave the presentation, Katie, got measles. And I thought that was so funny, and I was thinking about all of you guys, because today, that's not a problem. People don't get measles today. But back on the Oregon Trail in 1848, that was one of the problems that my characters encountered. We have been dealing with vaccinating diseases for more than 200 years. And the first vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner for smallpox. So Dr. Jenner, he was trying to figure out why some people got smallpox and why some people didn't. And he noticed particularly that milkmaids did not get smallpox. He looked a little bit further into this and noticed that they were always being exposed to these cows, and the cows were getting a disease called cowpox. So because the milkmaids were exposed to a very similar virus, cowpox, they were then able to be immunized against the smallpox virus. So by getting one of these types of viruses, their immune system recognized that this kind of thing was bad for it and protected against smallpox. Some of these vaccines have been developed within your lifetime, I know I remember getting chicken pox as a kid. Have all of you gotten chicken pox? Did anybody get the chicken pox vaccine? Yeah, so, so I remember I was young and my, my older sister and I got chicken pox, but my little sisters got the vaccine and they never got chicken pox. I will never get chicken pox again because my body knows what it looks like and is able to fight against it. But similarly, my little sisters won't get chickenpox either because they got the vaccine, so their bodies know how to fight against it and prevent it. So we get a lot of vaccines as children, and then we also get boosters for these diseases as adults. So when we talk about the diseases, we talk about measles or smallpox or rabies or yellow fever. We, we know what the diseases look like because we've seen the victims of these diseases. But I'm actually going to talk about the pathogens for these diseases, which are little tiny microbes that infect cells and cause the body to get these diseases. And so there are different ways to protect against, or rather to combat these diseases, similarly to antibiotics or antivirals. But there's another form of defense that we can do before our bodies even encounter any of these viruses or bacteria that can prevent us from ever getting the diseases in the first place, and that's vaccinations. So there are different types of vaccines. One of them is a live attenuated vaccine, and that is where a scientist will take a virus or a bacteria and actually change the genetic material of that virus or bacteria. And this is easier to do with viruses because they have very much fewer genes than bacteria, but it's actually a live virus that is made to be not harmful to the body. There are some disadvantages of live attenuated vaccines because there's a very small chance, and usually not a chance at all, that it might revert to a uh, pathogenic virus. It's also bad for immunocompromised patients to get these kind of vaccines, and also they need to be refrigerated. So different countries that might not have access to refrigeration have a harder time to get these. There is an inactivated vaccine where scientists will actually kill, I'm going to say this in quotes, kill the pathogen um, by either heating it up or exposing it to chemicals or different radiation. And these are a lot safer than live attenuated vaccines. However, they aren't as, um, as strong. So usually people need to get boosters against viruses that use these inactivated vaccines. There are subunit vaccines. So the part of the virus or the bacteria that is actually pathogenic is usually on the outside of the virus or the bacteria. And so scientists can take these antigens and actually just use those as the vaccine. So just presenting the antigen to the body will elicit the immune defense. There are also toxoid vaccines. A lot of times bacteria cause disease because of the toxins that they release. So scientists can take these toxins and kind of de- toxify them by adding formalin to them. Also, conjugate vaccines are present, and those are often bacteria are surrounded by polysaccharides. And so um, young immune systems, like infant immune systems, don't recognize those polysaccharides as being a problem. So they'll, scientists will attach the polysaccharide to a known antigen and then use that as a vaccine. Adjuvants are very important in vaccines. Adjuvants are 
usually aluminum salts that are added to the vaccine that trigger a danger to the, to the person. So in the bloodstream, having these adjuvants present along with a smaller amount of the actual vaccine will allow the immune system to know that it needs to make a large response to this antigen. So how do vaccines work? When a vaccine is entered into the bloodstream, it is recognized by an antigen-presenting cell. The antigen-presenting cell, or APC, takes in the antigen, breaks it into little pieces, and then presents it on the outside of the cell. It kind of just shows it to all the other cells nearby. It goes to places in the body, like lymph nodes and such, where actual B cells and T cells will accumulate. These T cells recognize that the antigens presented and alert other T cells and B cells that there's something bad in the body. B cells will recognize either the APC cell or other antigens in the bloodstream and start kind of producing antibodies. And a lot of these B cells will become plasma B cells, which produce a lot of antibodies. And antibodies are specific for the antigen and bind to it, either targeting it for degradation or not allowing it to bind to other cells. T cells become active, and if it's a, um, a live attenuated virus that actually has infected a cell, a T cell will, become, will be a killer T cell and kill that cell that's infected. Now, these, this is very important because the B cells and T cells that have responded to the, this vaccine will become memory B cells and T cells. And so when an actual pathogen is present, these memory B cells and T cells will already be available and ready to combat this virus or bacteria. So it's instead of having one soldier present to combat the, the invader, you have an entire army present to combat the invaders. So there are some caveats to vaccine development. First of all, there's a high mutation rate in pathogens. Our bodies have a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, so when we replicate ourselves, it's a lot more precise. The polymerase can go back and change any mistakes that it, may, that it makes before going on. Many viruses have an RNA genome. So in, in this example, influenza virus has an RNA genome, which does not have this ability to go back and fix any errors that it makes. So it's very error-prone. Another problem is that some of the pathogens don't have known immunity. HIV, for example, there's, no, there's been no cases of a patient developing an immunity to HIV. So since we have, for example, people can get immune to chickenpox. Once I've had chickenpox, I'm never going to get it again. So, I have, so we know that there's some sort of immunity that builds up in the patient. However, without any immunity to HIV, we don't have an example of any, any way that that's happened. So we don't really know exactly how to make a virus to mimic that immunity. So this is just a simple infographic that shows how far we have come more than 200 years since we've been having vaccine development. And some illnesses have been completely eradicated, like smallpox, and some of them, most of them are down more than 70%, but we still have a long way to go. Um, new techniques that are being developed, one of which is an actual DNA-based vaccine, which just presents the DNA, the, the nucleic acid, to the bloodstream. One is a virus vector vaccine, which allows the DNA of a pathogen to be put into a virus or a bacteria that we already have immunity against, or not harmful virus or bacteria. We have delivery techniques, and I think that there are at least one or two different viruses that I can think of that use a nasal spray, like influenza. And then also there's a patch technique being developed. So instead of a needle in the arm, you get a patch with many little needles that delivers the vaccine, and that's good for different countries. So one, the last thing that I'm going to leave you with is how important vaccines are, not just for the individual, individual, but for the community. So I get my teeth checked because, for me, I don't want cavities, and that's just what I can do for myself. But for the community, we get vaccines to protect everyone, to protect your little niece that's just born, to protect your grandfather who might have an immune-compromised system. So if we have an unvaccinated group, and we introduce a pathogen, everybody gets infected. If we have many people who are vaccinated and we introduce a pathogen, then the many vaccinated people will protect even some of the unvaccinated people. If only a few people are vaccinated, then there are very few people who are actually protected from the vaccine. So in summary, we've come a long way in vaccine development, and there's even more to do. And scientists are currently working on very, very many new types of vaccines, new vaccine development, and we, as a community, can help each other to, and help the scientists and help the world 
to eradicate some of these diseases. So I'm just going to leave you with the suggestion to get your yearly influenza vaccination.